think we'll start off with a nice video so everyone can get a bit of a crack about sort of who you are and, and, and obviously all the skills you possess in your, in your locker. And then uh, I'll sort of hand over to Pat where kids have, have put some questions together and, yeah. and we'll fire some things. And just, just hear about your story of cricket, really. Uh, okay. I'm sure you have a lot to share with us, to be fair. Yeah, yeah no worries. So let, let's, let's, let's try to see if we can uh, pull this up quickly. Um, so yeah, obviously, uh, nice, nice little video for everyone to see. Um, obviously, who you all about, really, James? Um, and and I, I think some nice big hits in there as well. Um, some grand shots there, some unorthodox shots, a uh, couple leg side wide stumpings, and and I hope everyone could see that camera dive that you took as well on one of those catches. Um, but uh, no, it'd be great to have you on, mate. And I'll pass you on to Patrick. He'll just lead us on a little bit more. Perfect. Um, right, thanks, Brett. Uh, also, thanks very much to all the pupils who have sort of logged in uh, to watch this. Really appreciate that. But a special thanks to James, obviously, for giving up your time this evening. Really appreciate you doing so. Um, obviously, we're really conscious that these situations, they can fly really quickly. So we'll get straight straight into it, we'll get the ball rolling. Um, we've got a number of sort of sporty students at the school who try and balance their time between a number of different sports. And this is something that we... We really encourage at the school. Were you a key all round sportsman yourself at school? And was if so, how was how did cricket come to be your number one sport? Yeah, I've always been um one of those sort of lads who who when I was younger didn't really like watching. So I was always looking to play, 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 whatever sort of sort of popped up. So um I always played a lot of football, always played a lot of rugby. Um when I came to school, um anything that they sort of put on. Um, wasn't sort of the luckiest with the school I was at in terms of their sports department, but anything that pops up, sort of cross country, hockey, um, anything like that, I was sort of I chucked myself into that. Um, I'd probably say football was my my favourite sport until I was probably fourteen or fifteen. Um, I always loved playing. I played up until I was nineteen or twenty when when I signed my first contract. So um, that would definitely be something that I'll I'll do after my career. Um, but yeah, I'd say cricket sort of became number one, I think, I think by chance. I played sort of um, for Bristol Rovers until I was about 12 um, and then sort of got let off of their programme. So the chance to play county cricket came up at around the similar time. So um, I always enjoyed playing against the best people, playing against the best teams and, and challenging myself. So even though I hadn't played a huge amount of cricket, that was something I chucked myself into. And then it turned out obviously really well. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was lucky that my home cricket club's out the back of my house, so myself and my older brother um, took every opportunity to get out there, uh, use the nets, and it's a, it's a great club with a great youth section, so we were very lucky in that respect. Um, but yeah, I think probably when I got to about 14, 15 was when, I, when cricket really took over for me, and um, I sort of uh, pursued it as, as a real career option. Perfect. And just, just touching on that, um, the angle of sort of balancing your time again, um, yeah. I hope I'm right in saying that you made your first class debut in 2016, yep. and then two years later you graduated from Loughborough. So from an academic perspective, how did you find sort of balancing your time again from a, an academic and sorting sort of mindset? How did you find that? Yeah, it was really tough, but I think it's something that if you want to succeed in both in both facets, it's something you've got to you've got to learn to, to balance your time. It's a really key skill in life, I think. Um, you know, 
scheduling, planning the time, um, making sacrifices is obviously the big thing with that is you're going to have to to give up on other things in life. You know, as a student who was on a, essentially a full-time cricket program and a full-time degree, um, other things like, you know, coming home, um, catching up with friends in Bristol where I live, um, going out with your mates during, during the week when you've got, you know, early gym sessions and early net sessions and all sorts going on is, is tough, but it was something that I was always willing to, to give my best crack and work on, I think. Um, you know, I'm lucky now that it's, it's turned out very well and I'm in a position now where I'm back home, I'm playing, um, and I'm able to settle down a little bit more, but I think it's really important to, that time management is something that if you want to pursue a career in high performance, generally, not just sport, but anything um, in business or, or anything else um, that requires you to be at the top of your game, I think that's something that it's best to start early. And obviously it looks like with such a good program you guys have got, that's something that, that, these, uh, that these boys and girls and lads and ladies have, have started to learn already. Excellent. Um, so I know you've already alluded to your earlier years with regards to cricket, but who is there anyone who's sort of been your biggest inspiration throughout your career, especially from a younger age, perhaps, um, and all sort of role models throughout your career? Yeah, I mean, to start with, it would have been it would have been my brother. He sort of followed the same path as I did, but sort of fell off off of the sort of system at about twenty. Um, so I think learning from his mistakes was a, a really big one for me. Um, seeing where he sort of um, fell down and, and learning from that. And he's been really good for me in that respect. Um, sort of going up the system, my, what would be my, my college coach when I went to what would be upper sixth at um, Filton College is called, uh, with a really good program similar to sort of what you guys are offering here. Um, a guy called Tim Hancock, who used to play for Gloucestershire. Um, He's now the academy director at Gloucestershire. He was someone who sort of introduced me to the idea of, of building your own game, being the best version of yourself sort of thing. So that's really stuck with me, and it's good that he's still around to, to talk to and learn from still. Um, Players-wise, there's always people you look up to. Um, and in sort of similar roles to myself, I like the sort of old-fashioned opening batsmen, Strauss, Cook, Smith, um, sort of those guys who, who maybe like myself aren't the most flair sort of modern day hit every ball for six kind of players but do the best with what they've got work hard um, and sort of come out with good results through through sheer effort and, and knowing themselves um, so those guys would be would be big ones for me. Uh, yeah, good. I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to touch on that aspect of when you mentioned like your brother falling off the pathway a little bit. I hope you don't mind me asking about this, but yeah. I think that it's important that uh, aspiring young cricketers have the sort of realization that not every young cricketer goes on to have a or is fortunate enough to have a successful professional career. How did your brother cope with the uh, uh, almost disappointment, if you like, of, of not doing that? And and what was what would be your biggest advice in that situation? Yeah, he'd be the first to admit that he sort of let the system sort of bring him down and get to him a little bit too much. Um, I think he sort of took things from all the coaches that were sort of feeding into him. He took everything a bit literally and it allowed him to sort of become a bit scrambled. Um, I mean, he's very open about it now and he still loves his cricket now for, for that. Um, but yeah, I think he, he coped with it pretty well. I think it's obviously hard to to be rejected. Um, I had it growing up. I didn't make it into the academy at Gloucestershire till I was 17. Um, I had countless numbers of trials and sessions before that where I was told, you know, there was stuff to work on and wasn't quite there yet. Um, you got to realise that I think a really big message that I like to give people is the fact that not everything happens in a flash. Um, I've been very lucky the last two years that everything seems like it's been plain sailing, but it certainly wasn't the case for the, a long period before that. So um, I see a lot more these days, late developers in county cricket, people coming in, you know, going to uni, coming back and succeeding, going out of the game for periods and then coming back after performing for clubs and minor counties and 
um, development sides. So, you know, if, if something doesn't happen straight away, it's, it's not the end of the world. I think it's just that key to keep working hard, um, keep realising, sort of having the desire to, to work hard. Um, and I think, you know, everything, everything bounces out in the end. I think whether that means you succeed or not, um, it's, as I said, a great skill to have in the walk of life as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, we saw from the, the the short clip that you're a, a wicketkeeper batsman uh, and representing that you've bowled a little bit before. Um, in terms of for our all-rounders out there, how do you ensure, I'm sure that you have to work incredibly hard at both facets of the game, but how do you make sure that you personally dedicate enough time in order to keep progressing and developing in both fields of the game? Is that something that's a challenge in itself or, or how do you manage that? Yeah, definitely. I think the last couple of years has been key for that. I think coming on to the England programme, I think I've been pushed a lot harder regarding my wicket keeping. Um, before it was probably, I'd say I was a part-time wicket keeper, sort of it was a, a bit part sort of skill. Um, but they sort of made me realise that, you know, it's a, it's a great way to get into teams, especially in, in one day cricket. Um, so yeah, now I think it's a lot simpler for me. I approach both in the same manner. I try and dedicate 50% 50, 50 of my time to each. Um, I think before, if you if you are a batting all-rounder or a bowling all-rounder and you have a, a skill that's maybe better than the other one, um, I'd always dedicate a bit more time than you initially think to the one that's maybe your second skill. Because um, you don't... You don't sort of realise how much it can improve in a short space of time. If you work on a couple of small things, it can have a really big impact. Um, I found that with my wicket keeping that it's got a lot better over the last year because I've got a, I've almost shown how I want to do it and realised what the best way for me is. So if you're a fast bowler and you want to bowl a little bit quicker, try and think of one or two points that are going to help you do that. Don't try and overcomplicate things. Um, and just try and continue to do the things you do well the best you can. Um, but yeah, if you can dedicate as much time to each, it's brilliant. But of course, that's down to how you see how you see fit. Um, and in terms of obviously you play all forms of the game, um, how do you manage the sort of transition from going from the first class four day cricket and then into twenty twenty cricket? Uh, do you have a favourite and, and how do you manage that transition? Yeah, I'd say that um, four-day uh, cricket's always been my favourite. Test cricket's always been the dream for me. Um, but of course, with the development of the other two and what now might be three formats, it's important to be able to go between between all sorts of formats. It's, I think a skill that not many people think about until it actually hits you and you find yourself in that situation. I think last year when I started playing the white ball formats, it was something sort of hit me quite hard. I struggled a little bit to start with. I think the transition specifically from white ball cricket to red ball cricket can be particularly difficult. Um, but I'm a firm believer that the basics that you develop for me personally as a batsman, um, the basics you develop to play red ball cricket make up 90% of what you're going to do in a white ball game. Um, I think the basics that you practice and you do lots of volume and hit lots of balls and, you know, your weight transfer and, you know, your bat swing and stuff like that is all very similar. Um, it's just a case of adjusting your mindset to transfer between, between the two. Obviously, you have a more attacking, positive mindset in a white ball game, um, a more sort of resilient, um, grind out sort of attitude in the red ball game. So I think the 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 psychological side of things, the the thinking side of things, is the thing that um, is the big one in terms of transitioning between the two. Yeah, you just touched on a little bit uh, there in terms of what the next question was going to be. Um, you've talked about you the times where you admit that you've struggled a little bit. I think as, as cricketers, we've all sort of been through those those hard times. Uh, and there's a saying that classes, uh, 
form your temporary and class is permanent. How much of a believer are you in that saying? And and how have you how do you personally overcome your the challenges that we face as cricketers from a psychological perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think every player in the world, all the best players, have periods where they don't score as many runs as they'd like. Um, take Virat Kohli for an example. The start of the IPL this year didn't really hit his straps as much as he'd want to, but came back well and scored runs towards the back end. I think everyone who plays cricket goes through those spells. It's completely natural. I think is recognising and being confident enough within yourself to realise that, you know, you are good. And I think one thing that I do is I like to, as as vain as I sound right now, I like to watch videos of myself when I've played well. I'm lucky enough that there is a lot of footage taken and available online for us to use. And I like to think back to times and visualise times where I've played well, how I felt in those moments, and, and try and recreate that. Um, that's something that I use personally, but it's, it's being aware of and sort of confident in yourselves that, you know, things do turn around. It might just be one moment where you, a, a switch flicks and you go from feeling a bit off with your movements and your timings and, and sort of the positions you're getting in. And then suddenly everything just clicks. And it's important to realise when those moments do happen and try and take advantage of them. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you mentioned also before about like the the one percenters and the basic skills and and how you still as a professional you're still going over those basic skills on a, on a regular basis in terms of hitting volume of balls and even like the most basic of drills. How how important is that to you as a professional and how often sort of are you doing those kind of drills? Yeah, I definitely. Um, I think that sometimes, especially during short format cricket, I think you have a tendency to, to forget them a little bit. Um, you go into a net and just try and whack every ball for six, which is obviously important, but how many balls in a game are you trying to do that to? I think now I've realised the, the importance of them and I've experienced why they're so important. I try and do, you know, in the season, maybe once a week for, for 20 minutes or half an hour, just do real simple, you know, underarm speeds and just feel the ball out the middle of the bat. Um, get into the position that I want to be in come game time um, and I think that just does it does wonders for your confidence and it makes you feel like even if you go into a net and don't maybe play as well as you want it, it makes you realise that you know I, I'm, I'm in a good space I'm getting into good positions I know what I need to do and hopefully when it comes to a game then you sort of that instinct takes over and you start to just naturally get in positions that you want to get in. Um, but yeah, it's definitely important. In the winter, I try maybe, you know, 20 minutes at the start of every session, um, almost just build up into my net. Um, start with some underarms, some overarm throws, maybe use a machine if you've got one there, before I then get into facing bowlers and, and dog sticks and other stuff that you can sort of play around with. Um, I think it's really important to, to nail those basics as much as you can, really. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's something that's often seen as the most boring part, isn't it? But I guess yeah. they're the ones that make a, a biggest difference, don't they? Mm -hmm. Throughout the course yeah, of the season. Absolutely. I think you see footage of, again, the best players doing it and sort of talking about it. And it's just muscle memory, getting into those habits of thinking about how you want to do it in a game and and just almost grooving your body to, to do it over and over again. Excellent. Um, as you've progressed throughout the age group, you talked about yourself playing from sort of an early age, but as you've progressed throughout the age groups and, and have matured as a player and you've gained more and more experience, how has your mindset changed in the way that you prepare and approach the, the games of cricket that you play? Um, I wouldn't say I have too many routines as such. I just like to to take make sure I get time to take a step back before I go out on the field. I think... You know, everyone's different in how many balls they hit before a game, how many balls they bowl, how many catches they take. Um, and I wouldn't say I have a set number of any of those. I think it's more of just a feel. When I feel I'm ready, I'm ready, and I just get myself off to the changing room. But I feel like I need, you know, just a quarter of an hour before, before, you know, the bell goes to just sit down with myself, 
maybe put some music on, maybe just sort of chat with lads in the dressing room, but just sort of a normal scenario that you're not thinking about cricket, you're just sort of allowing yourself to relax so that you're not too built up with energy when, when you get out on the field. I think, that's re- I think that's really important for me as someone who loves to think about the game. Um, it's really important for me to just strip everything back and go out there with a clear, a clear head, essentially. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. Just to elaborate on that a little bit, as someone who likes to think about the game, and personally, I'm someone who probably overthinks everything in the world. Yeah. But how do you how do you switch off? The, is there a time where you do think I actually I need I need to start thinking about it? And is there a way that is there a coping mechanism for that? That's something I do really struggle with. I think I've always always have done, and I still do. I think this last month is the first time that I haven't picked up a bat for a few weeks and I think I went back for my first session last week and it felt like it made such a difference sort of just a clean slate and you can just build on on what you've done before um yeah I think it's it's really important I think one mechanism I use is I've always been a fan of sort of psychology is something that I did my degree in um and a lot of lads these days use sort of meditation and yoga and I, I don't find that, that that helps but sitting sort of just in a room in my bed or wherever and just and just breathing and I feel like the feeling myself breathe is something that you don't think about ever it just happens naturally um, but being able to just like have that focus point that you can go back to and everything just seems like it's restarting um, that's something that I like to do. I mean, it might be just while I'm sat watching telly or something or reading a book or whatever. Um, but just almost like a, a reset button that just helps me just clear my head, which might have so many things going on in, in there at the time. You know, I might have just played a horrible shot that day, got out, been really annoyed with myself. But I think, and I might go back the next day and have those same feelings of frustration, but being able to have that, one thing I can go back to, um, I find really, really useful. Yeah, I can certainly relate to that in terms of finding a way to press the reset button and almost make yourself hungry for the situation again. But you, you must find that really difficult in a season where you almost, as a professional, not having that time to sort of, or as much time to, to reset and, and somehow you... Yeah, you've just got you to... Go how, how much time do you get to do that? Yeah, I mean, in the season, you're playing four or five days a week. It's a really packed schedule, um, especially this year where it was obviously shortened and games came really thick and fast. It's really difficult to find that time. I think same as when you may be feeling out of form and you feel like you need a training session, but there isn't, there isn't time for it. Um, I guess it's just making time, you know, what's important to you, what, um, what's really, really going to benefit you moving forward. Is it going to be going back, getting a really good night's sleep, just chilling out and doing nothing? Is it going to be going into the nets for an extra half hour and coming back the next day feeling like everything's in good order? Um, yeah, but for me, it's, I don't like to, to train too much. I think it's important not to burn yourself out. Um, so I think that relaxation time is something that I find really useful. Um, and I like to just have an hour in the evening to just, with myself, do whatever I want, and just almost let things go for a bit before before tackling them again. Thank you. Um, and so you mentioned it before as well in terms of um, you had a bit of a, a few weeks off and then not picked up a bat, for, for example. How has COVID affected your training recent, in, in recent weeks? Um, and how was it playing in front of no crowds last year um, and the effect on yourself as a performer and the team? Yeah, it certainly affected us. Obviously, the preparation going into the season was shortened, so guys didn't have as much time to, to prepare as usual. Um, it was weird sort of coming to sort of April and, and not having any cricket to play. Um, you sort of, your body just sort of, you have that date where you're preparing for and then you get to mid-March and that's just all taken away. It was a bit strange. Um, regarding the crowds... I mean, we got used to it pretty quickly, but it was obviously a big change, especially going to grounds like, like Edgebaston, um, 
it was very strange and there was sort of a, a really strange atmosphere. Um, they did obviously all they could at the grounds with music and, and trying to keep things as normal as possible, but you can't make up for sort of the loss of that. And especially in the, um, in the sort of test bubble, watching test cricket from the sidelines with no one in there, you sort of think, especially it was my first experience of it, you're like, it's not always like this, surely. It's, obviously it's not, but it's just like, that's your first taste and that's what's in my head now. So hopefully to turn up this time next year and there'll be thousands of people there um, would be a big shock, definitely. But um, yeah, it's something we've got to get used to and um, hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later, but um, just something you've got to adjust to and, and get on with it, really. Yeah, definitely. Fingers crossed for, for everyone. Um, you've played with some uh, fantastic players, both with and against. Are there any standout performers, and if so, why? Um, to play with, I think Michael Klinger's the, the best one for me. He um, opened the batting for us for go on 10 years, Australian. Um, just a really intelligent person, I think. Very good captain, very good batsman. And I think the thing that stood out for me with him was how calm he was able to keep in pressure situations. The amount of games that he won on his own, purely from thinking clearly, making good decisions and knowing how to approach an innings, I think was really good to watch. He never let, you know, the scoreboard impact how he played. Um, he always knew when to attack and when to sort of hold back a little bit. Um, and he was really good at communicating with, with what is a young squad we've got. Um, he always sort of tried to understand every player, um, what they were good at, what they wanted to improve, and how he could help them do that. And I think the impact he had with us was, was massive. Um, regarding playing against, I'd say Usman Khawaja was a different level, really. I think he sort of again just seemed so calm um so confident in his own game that he just allowed things to happen and he just knew what he would do with every delivery um bowlers wise um Dale Stain I mean I played him once in a second team game and you sort of get a, a feeling of why people are the, the best in the world they just they're just so like They've got such clarity about what they're trying to do. Um, and they don't go away from the basics. Sort of going back to what I've said earlier is the best bowlers I've faced, have, they don't miss. They don't try too much. They might have two deliveries that they bowl, but they don't give you anything as a batsman. So I think it's really important to just understand what your best ball is, what your best shots are, um, and create a game around those because... You can't go too far wrong if you land the ball top of off nine times out of ten and if you hit the middle of the bat nine times out of ten. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting to say, like, it's cricket, I feel it's definitely a sport that can become very overcomplicated at times, but you, you, the way that you keep going back to the, the basics, uh, I think, is fundamentally really, really important. Yeah. Um, just on that, then, in terms of the sort of final question from me, what would your biggest single piece of advice be to a, a young cricketer at Scarborough College um, going through the Centre of Excellence at the minute? Yeah, um, I think it would just go back to, to setbacks. I think that's really important. I think everyone has them. Um, and sort of responding to them in the right way and understanding that, you know, one setback isn't going to dictate what happens moving for forward totally. Um just remaining really sort of having that self-belief, uh, really clear on what you want to what you want to achieve and give it 110 percent in all, all areas to try and do that. Um, I think it's important, you know, for you guys, it will be really important for you to, you know, concentrate on your cricket, also concentrate on your studies. I think when I was younger I I tried to make sure I did that so that I had options. Um, I wasn't putting too much pressure on one thing. And I think that is really important as, as well. Trying to play all sports as you possibly can, you know, not putting all your eggs in one basket. Too early, I think is really important. Um, 
and there's certainly skills that can come from other sports that will improve your cricket. You know, the the increased physicality of, of football, rugby, um, swimming, things like that are certainly going to help you hit the ball further and bowl the ball quicker and reach the ball quicker in the outfield and stuff like that. So it's important to develop all those skills um, to become the best cricketer you can be. Perfect. Well, from my perspective, I really appreciate you giving up your time this evening. So thank you very much. No um, Mark, Mr. Cunningham, have we got any further questions from yourself? Or I see that Mr. Inky's just joined in. Or do you want to take a few questions from the floor, Brett? Uh, yeah, I, I think... I, I've got a question, obviously, from, from my side. James, obviously, you've spoken um, quite, you know, obviously, your studies here at Loughborough yeah. University, obviously, great university in terms of, you know, sports and, and everything that they offer. Um, and, and I don't think you want to see um, uh, people that are on here in, in the Zoom tonight. They've actually considered Loughborough as, as a university. So, just, just really from your side, obviously, you are very still young as a player. Uh, you, you take your focus on your studies. Have you had any thoughts about using your studies when you've done playing cricket? Is there a career you'd like to move towards? Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm currently in the process of applying for a master's in, in performance psychology. I think it's, as someone who, as I've said, is I'm a big thinker when it comes to playing cricket, I think as well as something that I'd like to pursue post cricket career I think is something that can really help me now um, there's so much advancement in in the area of sports psychology at the moment I think it would be really great to learn about that and be able to apply it to myself and, and my teammates um, so that's something I'm looking into I'm also trying to do a bit of writing um, like journalism um, but just sort of when I have thoughts just getting them down on paper I find really good i think it's nice to have a sort of folder of things that i maybe think about so at the moment i've been sort of looking at social media and how it impacts impacts cricketers and sportsmen um i just think it's really nice to explore different things that might might have a lot of meaning to me but also other people um and hopefully try and help people that way so that's another thing that i've been been trying to do i think it's really important to pursue other things even if you are focusing at the highest level on on cricket it's really important to develop yourself in as many areas as you can oh lovely thank you very much and, and, and maybe just to elaborate on a, on a point you threw out there obviously social media is, is a major thing in our lives obviously our days especially for our, our younger ones as well and and you sort of the social media and the impacts on on cricketers is, is something you sort of found in, in terms of social media with cricketers um, positively, negatively, how I respect them as the topic Yeah, I think there's so many. The thing is, there's so many amazing things that it can do. Um, it can, you know, even past that of scores, updates, and videos of sort of footage of the best players and highlights and that sort of thing. Um, the sort of connect, like the connections you can make through those those platforms is is really amazing um obviously there's always going to be downsides you know stuff like online um abuse which is something that in cricket is starting to increase sadly i think some people use it as a way to to obviously be to be hurtful to people which um isn't nice but i think if people have the right intentions with social media there's so much potential um to make the world better um that there's that's why I think everyone uses it. It's it's amazing to see some of the things that can be achieved by social media. Um, the reach that it has is obviously obviously brilliant, and especially for cricket, which is a worldwide sport, um, it's something that continue can continue to sort of increase participation and increase uh, increase passion for the game. No, I love it. No, obviously, yeah, yeah. So appreciate you on that. What I wonder if Mr. Mr. Rinky, um, obviously one of our coaches and a, and a former international himself, if, if he has any questions from his end. Sorry, I'm not very IT literate. James, uh, thank you very much for your session this evening. No um, 
I, I <clears throat> the one question that I that I, I will pose to you is um, I, I unfortunately came in a little bit late. Apologies for that, but. Uh, the one question that I will post is the importance of process um, in terms of being able to back the process and the preparation and all the time that you put in there. How important is believing in the process when you're out in the middle for you? Yeah, massive. I think it's really important to understand that the majority of the time is important to trust and understand the process over the outcome. Um, you put in so much training and so much you have so many conversations and do so many drills and watch so much cricket and there's so much information that you can put into your practice um, it's so important to them whilst you, once you do get into the game um, trust all the work you've done um, trust all the things you've done well in your practice and you know even if it does result in a few bad results over time it's going to start to balance out i remember listening to a conversation that um, manus labashane had on sky sports after he had obviously a really good ashes summer um, and he's a massive believer in the fact that if you trust the process and trust what you're doing behind the scenes um off the field and in the nets and in the gym um that it's absolutely going to result in in good performances obviously not 100 percent of the time but um it's 100 percent of process over outcome sport so i think that's what you need to, to try and focus the majority of your time on perfect thank you very much and i hope everyone was listening to that um the last question that i have for you is what's the best part about being a professional cricketer um i get to bat every day i just love i love like that's what I used to love as a kid. I used to love going in the nets every day after school and going on the weekends and going to watch my brother and my dad play. Um, I just, I, I love the, I always loved playing cricket. So I think the fact that I get to go to the ground every morning, the first thing I get to do is put my pads on and have a hit. I think that's brilliant. And to be able to, to call, you know, traveling around the country and the world and playing the sport that, as a as a kid was what I chose to do. Now that I get to do it all the time, I think it's great. And the fact that I can play against all these great players and play with great people um, and push myself 100% every day. Um, yeah, so that's that's the best part. I think there's so many things to love about it. But um, yeah, just the fact that I get to hit balls every day, I just love it. All right, no, brilliant, James. Thank you very much for that. And again, thanks for this evening. Cheers, Rick. Yeah, obviously, yeah, James, just again, thank you very much uh, for your time this evening. As you thank Pat and, and Pete and as the people that put their questions uh, to us to clarify, so definitely, uh, you know, I think created some motivation in us, some inspiration, and, and some things for, for a lot of our leads, our younger speakers to take away. And, and, and definitely think about so uh, you know greatly appreciate it. I'm sure you've got a few more fans up here in North Yorkshire now that will uh, watch you nice and closely and, and, and they'll be watching you when, you when you get those bat and pads out of even, hopefully soon rather than later um, so, yeah yeah no, thanks very much for having me um, pleasure uh, best of luck for the for the winter and hopefully we get a full a full summer in next year for you guys to, to play as much as possible. Well, thank you. No problems. Anything else, Mr. Roberts? All good? No, all good, yeah. Thanks again, James. We'll let you in, go and enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm sure you uh, got things to do. Uh, thanks, everyone, for logging in. Thanks to all the uh, pupils. Um, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Yes. See you soon. Yes, yeah.